We pray that you would build in us uh, a, uh, not only a desire for your word, but fill that desire. Show us what you will today. We pray for the ability for your spirit to make the written word come alive, to become the living word, the same word that was reflected when Jesus put on flesh and dwelt among us. We pray, Lord, that you would get out of us what you want. We pray that the word that you preach would be profitable and useful for your righteousness and your kingdom. That the fruit that comes from this moment would be done not only for our benefit, but for more for your kingdom, and so that the world might come to believe in your son. We thank you for the privilege and the responsibility of being your church. We ask that you bless us for this endeavor and that you continue to forgive us our sins and guide us, resource us well, and lead us away from evil. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue on in the Gospel of John, Gospel according to John. I've got four bullet points about the basic summary of what we've covered so far. The first one is Jesus is the Christ. Second one is the church's basic job is to bear witness to what we've seen in Jesus. So bear witness. The Greek word simian will appear again in today's lesson, and that those are signs of authority. And as we saw last week, and we'll see again this week, the Holy Spirit is a central teaching of Jesus. And so we dive right into chapter 4. According to the scripture, it says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. That's John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was doing the baptizing. I never saw that before. Have you? So the disciples, and here's a blank, the disciples were baptizing. And their baptisms uh, led toward more disciples. Why was John baptizing? So he was baptizing and people would repent. And they would, they would see, they would course correct. His main message was, behold, the kingdom of God is near or at hand. So he was baptizing... The Greek word for repentance is built upon uh, the experience of having your eyes opened for you to see something clearly. I've mentioned this to this class before. When you see clearly, you naturally course correct. It's a natural phenomenon. If, if you knew uh, what happened to your body every time you smoked a cigarette and you actually had some sort of glaring truth about that, the course correction would be no addictions as important or as powerful over me as what this is doing to me. And sorry if any of y'all are smoking, I want to highlight that. But the things we do, the lifestyles we live, the decisions we make are deeply affected by what we know, by what we've seen. Some things we do fairly uh, blindly. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is if a, a tech student is driving down uh, 19th and texting while driving, and they look up and realize that their tree is headed, headed for a, a light pole. They've seen the light pole. What's their natural response? Break and turn. If they're an Aggie, they speed up. Just kidding. <laughs> they, they break and turn. Course correction is part of the deal. Um, and so John was baptizing for repentance. To have your eyes open to behold to see. Jesus' disciples, it says, uh, by, through baptism, he was adding disciples. And the basic word for disciples are followers. So the baptism of Jesus is, and of his disciples leads toward 
discipleship, which has informed uh, the baptism done in many churches. That's, that's my understanding of the baptism of the water. Uh, I know a lot of churches teach you're baptized in the water for the remission of sins. That's the Church of Christ teaching. That's what most Baptist churches teach, which negatively means that if you aren't baptized in the water, what's, what happens if you die? You're living in sin. You got whatever they say. That results you go to hell or, or however you want to say it. Um, the baptism I understand is based on this form, which is water baptism is an act of faith to choose to respond to Jesus as one of the steps toward discipleship. It's not hellfire insurance. That's why you'll catch me uh, encouraging people if they're kind of on the fence whether they ought to get baptized now or not. It's okay if you wait. It's okay until you feel more confident. But as soon as you are confident that this is what you're called to do, there's no benefit in waiting. We can get more theological on that, but there's more things to discuss today. And so after this happened, their numbers grew. Because their numbers grew, they were required to move on. And it says that now he had to go through Samaria. Now I've got that quoted here. Had to go through Samaria. As you'll see in the story, does your Bible have a map? If you'll notice on the map, there are two cities just west of the Jordan River. A good ways north, it's closer to Galilee than Judea. And these two cities, uh, Salem and Anon, are where Jesus is baptizing, kind of near where John the Baptist is also baptizing at the same time. They decided to go to Galilee, but first they have to go to a city down here. So they, they're going to Galilee, and they had to go through this city to get there. And it's tempting to say, well, there must have been uh, a mountain range or something that changed the geography. But it wasn't geographical, as we'll see in today's story. Uh, Jesus felt compelled to go through Samaria to do ministry. Whereas most Jews would have taken advantage of the fact that there are a few miles already to the north, let's push on while we've got daylight. Or they would cross over to the east of the river and go up to avoid Samaria. Jesus intentionally went to Samaria. Uh, and I think that's, the map's helpful to point out when the scriptures say he had to go to Samaria. Uh, and here's a, here's a blank for you. This was not geographical. You have to go through Lubbock to get to Reed Oso if you're coming from Dallas. And so there's a lot of things you say I have to go to geographically. It's part of the deal. Uh, but it wasn't geographical for, for Jesus. But uh, he had to go, here's a blank, for the mission. You could say because he heard a word from God or the Holy Spirit compelled him to go, but in the same sense that he was driven into the desert after baptism, based on the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, this is the same sense he had to go through Samaria. <clears throat> in Samaria, he came upon a woman. He was alone. His disciples traveled into town, and he asked her for a drink. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? So there's a few issues here. Um, his disciples will be shocked in a few moments when they arrive, and he's a rabbi, a teacher, speaking openly to a woman, regardless of her ethnicity. She's just female. You're not supposed to do that. But in this case, there's a hint, since they're dealing with water and drinking, that this is an issue of uncleans uh, uncleanness. And so she points out, uh, and I put the word unclean here in quotes, to drink from a Samaritan a vessel would be unclean for a Jew. He's asking for a sip of her Coke. Yeah, it's gross. And I've added another little... Uh, sentence to this, she is highlighting a division. You 
You'll notice this is a pattern. Jesus extends himself to her. They have a moment of, of spiritual intimacy. And her natural response is after that moment, she stays with that for a bit, but then she adds a division, probably because it's uncomfortable to immediately be close to a stranger. But to drink, for a stranger to drink from your drink and your female and a Samaritan, he's a Jew, is an intimate thing to, sh to share that vessel. And she says, but you're a Jew. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And he goes on to teach about living water. If you want to flip with me, you can. I'm going to flip to where it says John 7. Verses 38 and 39. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So once again, he brings up this topic of the Holy Spirit. So if you put in your notes, you've got living water equals Holy Spirit. So to gain a little altitude here, this is the second time we have record of him teaching somebody something, revealing something to another person. The first one was a Pharisee. The second one is the Samaritan woman. That in a, his audiences speak volumes to me, who he decided to approach and have these conversations with, although Nicodemus approached him. And the basic topic that he revealed to them was not primarily eternal salvation or atonement through the cross or baptism. It's the Holy Spirit to both Nicodemus and to uh, this woman. Another interesting thing to point out, for the most part, when a, uh, a female, regardless of how impactful she is on the story, appears, uh, this rarely happens to a man, but many times she's never named. I've always found that kind of interesting. And so he's teaching once again about the Holy Spirit. Everyone who drinks of the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she's ready. Instead of him immediately giving her the gift of the Holy Spirit, which, biblically speaking, would not occur until the day, the day of Pentecost, she brings up, or he asks her a question, go and call your husband. And upon that time, she says some things, and he's revealed to her that he's known the whole time that she's not currently married but living with a guy. She's been married and divorced five times. I've got a blank for you here. Jesus is not put off by this woman's lifestyle. Even in today's standards, this would be a pretty radical situation. Married five times and you're currently shacked up with a guy. But Jesus didn't point, put a finger in her face and give her a piece of his mind. We don't even know his opinion. He was busy trying to make a connection with this woman. And so he had this connection with her. He's already revealed the gift of this living water. She wants it. He goes deeper by revealing that he knows that she's not married. He, he's aware of her life situation. He's... He's revealing that he's in some ways intimate with her in terms of knowledge and spirit. 
And when that happens, she's, she does what she did at the beginning when he asked her for a drink of water. She names another division. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She's referring to a, a mountain. Make sure I get the spelling right. You should see it on your map. As she was, uh, as she mentioned that there is a mountain where the Samaritans worship. Mount Gerizim was a place where the Jews were traveling, the Hebrews were traveling in the desert for 40 years before they inherited the Holy Land. And while they traveled there, there was one location where Abraham told them to set up an altar unto the Lord. And she highlights the fact that as time has shifted over the years, the Samaritans have become a very much different type of person and religious group and ethnic group than the Jews. She's highlighting once again the division. It's similar to I'm having a conversation with somebody and uh, they're from south of the border. They happen to know English and we're having a moment, but as soon as we get deep, they start speaking Spanish. It's too much. Uh, a couple of things about the Samaritans. There's plenty of philosophies and theories on, on their development. We do know the Northern Kingdom, uh, during the days of the divided kingdom, the Northern Kingdom was called Israel, the Southern Kingdom was called Judah. Judah is where most of the storyline follows. That's where Jerusalem was. That's the part of the kingdom where the Babylon, Babylonians came and took captive all the, all the people, including Daniel, or those they didn't kill. The northern kingdom was destroyed before the southern kingdom by the Assyrians. Some of the prophets that we read are from the northern kingdom. Jonah, for example, went and traveled not to uh, Babylon, but to Nineveh. Remember Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital of the main, uh, the main uh, powerhouse at the time, Assyria. They had some struggles with Assyria. Uh, during all this time, the northern kingdom was not as stable as the southern kingdom. For instance, the southern kingdom uh, during the divided time had a lineage. King David, remember? His son was Solomon. And all the way down the line, you knew who the next king would, would be based on the oldest son of the current king. They also had the temple. The northern kingdom had to adjust quite a bit. Uh, one of the things they adjusted was the way they found leadership. Many times it was through military coups, through revolts, um, through polit uh, politicking, uh, all sorts of ways to locate who their leader was going to be. And that created some soil that was very shifty. In addition, uh, they had become, uh, they, they needed to set up different places of worship, which they did, and they shifted them as time marched on, uh, simply because they didn't feel called to travel into the southern kingdom to worship God. They wanted to have something closer. While they were living in this situation, the coastal religion called the Phoenicians that worshipped a certain group of gods called Baals, y'all heard this? This ultimately results in the Mount Carmel showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. These, th this form of religion had somehow intermixed with Judaism to become kind of a, a mumble change deal. So you've got that element occurred. So the, the long-term effects of the Northern Kingdom situation made them into a different religious-minded group than the Southern Kingdom people. In addition, they were treated differently when they were uh, invaded. Uh, whereas the Southern Kingdom, they were either killed or relocated the Northern Kingdom had a mixture of all sorts of stuff. Some of them were relocated, many of them were sold into slavery, many of them were killed, and several of them were just left there to fend for themselves. They did. So they became, <clears throat> I'll put it this way, 
I've noticed that 